This morning's celebration begins in the Red Book of Common Prayer on page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we hear a word from sacred scripture. reading from the book of Isaiah. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Ju Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her vindication shines out like the dawn, and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more, no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are a variety of gifts by the same Spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. The Word of the Lord. the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I love you. In the past week, how many times have you said those words to another human being? I love you. In the past week, how many times has someone said those words to you? I love you. When spoken in sincerity, these can be the most powerful words our language allows us to utter between human beings. We know that the weight and meaning of these words, I love you, means different things between different people. There is a depth to those words that are reserved in my life for one person only. It's when I say, I love you, to my beloved wife, Allison. It's different than when I say it to my girls, Meredith and Caroline. And the type of fatherly, fatherly love that I feel for them is different than when I say, I love you, to my mom or my dad, to my brother and my sister, to my grandmother, my best friend, when I say it to Nanette or Mother Virginia, these words, I love you, can be overused by some, lessening the word's significance. And the words, I love you, can be underused or not used at all, leaving some people, especially children, confused and hurt for a lifetime. These words are so powerful that their absence can leave scars. And of course, the words are meaningless if our actions are contrary to the words. We can say, I love you day and night, but if we are neglectful, selfish, disrespectful, abusive in physical or emotional ways, manipulative, deceitful, dishonest, or unfaithful to the ones we say those words to, then the words lose all meaning. Our words of love must be supported by continuous, faithful, and even rep repetitive actions of love. Now, it might be tempting to believe that the opposite of I love you is I hate you. But there's something that's more painful than I hate you. And I apologize for saying these words, these phrases out loud, especially for those who in the course of your life have had to hear it. Because they are painful phrases. It's two. One, I don't love you anymore. And two, I love someone else. We could never calculate the pain and the hurt and the tears that have been shed in human history because of those two phrases. And this leads us directly into our understanding of how God's love for us is different than the love we express between each other. Never, 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 no matter what, no matter who you are, Never, never, never will our God ever say to you or any of his children, I don't love you anymore. God will never say that. And God will never turn to any of us, any of his children, and say, I love someone else. It's impossible to comprehend the depth of God's love, the permanence of God's love, the weight of God's love. By our, our very existence, 
our being here, our presence. God says at the moment of our individual and personal creation, when he breathes life into us and creates us, that at that moment, God says, I love you. God loves you so much that he came down from his heavenly throne, put on the cloak of humanity, entered the world naked, and, like many of us, poor, so that he could tell us in person that he loves us. And God didn't just tell us he loves us, he showed us with his actions that he loves us. In today's gospel, Jesus begins to allow his true identity and his true purpose to be revealed. It's his first miracle. Jesus and his mother and his friends, they are at a wedding in Cana. First century Jewish weddings didn't take place on a single night like they do today. First century Jewish weddings took place over an entire week. The love between bride and groom and groom and bride was celebrated. The families and the friends rejoiced. They drank wine. They ate food for an entire week. You know they were Episcopalian. (laughs) It's in this setting of a festival of love that Jesus reveals a bit of himself and his purpose. And then the wine runs out. As you might expect with a week of of such celebration, the wine runs out. Jesus' mother notices, as mothers often do. And Mary asks Jesus to do something And he replies, not in a disrespectful way. The translation, it's harsh to the English ear. But but really, in the Greek, he's basically saying, what does this have to do with with you and with me? What what is this about with us? Then he says, my hour has not yet come. See, that exchange right there is so crucial and important to understanding the passage. Isaiah chapter 25 which is not part of the Isaiah passage that we read today. Isaiah chapter 25 says this. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will provide for all peoples a feast of rich food and choice wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the veil that veils all peoples, the web that is woven over all nations, He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. In first century Judaism, based on this prophecy of chapter 25 from Isaiah, it was believed that when the Messiah would come, when salvation from sin and death was going to appear as promised, that there would be a huge feast with rich food and choice wine. When Jesus says, my hour has not yet come, he is talking about that prophecy from Isaiah, the messianic banquet, that is the banquet of the Messiah. So when do we see Jesus' hour come? When do we see Jesus inaugurating the messianic banquet? At the Last Supper. Here in scripture, we have two bookends with wine. His first miracle of turning water into wine at a festival celebrating love. And then wine appears again at the Last Supper when, out of love, Jesus explains that he will pour out his blood as the new Passover lamb so that we can be saved. But let's go back to the wedding in Cana. The scripture says that there are six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. In Jewish tradition, it was necessary to purify your hands and your feet before reclining on the floor to eat. And this purification ritual has, of course, hints towards our own baptism. Jesus says to the attendants to fill them with water. 180 gallons of water in the stone jars used for purification. It's like Jesus coming to a party at your house and you're running out of beer or wine and Jesus says, fill up the bathtub with some water. (laughs) The steward, a.k.a. 
the wedding coordinator, discovers this most superior wine. And who does the steward go to for an explanation and to compliment? The steward goes to the groom, the bridegroom. The steward assumes that the groom is responsible for providing the wine. But we know that it was Jesus who provided the wine. Jesus takes on the responsibility of the bridegroom. He is revealing a bit of his identity and purpose by taking on the responsibility of the bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom who has come to marry us, to marry his bride, his people, the church. Jesus has come to marry you. God loves us so much that he wants to enter into a relationship of fidelity and intimacy and permanence that when he enters the human story during his first miracle, he shows himself as a groom at a wedding. Now we go back to the Isaiah passage that we did have today, chapter 62. And in that prophecy, Isaiah declares that God will come down and marry his people. Listen to the wedding language that Isaiah uses. You shall be called by a new name, Isaiah says. Now, not all brides today take the last names of their husbands, but it is custom and tradition to do so. You shall be a crown of beauty, Isaiah says. In first century Judaism, brides actually wore crowns, and They wore crowns, oftentimes, shaped like Jerusalem on the hill. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. Isaiah is promising a fertile and fruitful marriage between God and his people. And he comes right out and says that his people, his land, will be called married. Isaiah concludes, For as a young man marries a young woman, the translation better, uh, as a young man marries a young virgin, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The builder will marry us. Who built us? God did. In Genesis, when Eve is taken from the side of Adam, the Hebrew that's used suggests that Eve is not not that she's formed or made from Adam's side. The Hebrew suggests that Eve is built from Adam's side. God is the builder. See, all of these things are interconnected. From Genesis, where Eve is built from Adam's side, to Isaiah, where the Messianic banquet has rich food and choice wine, to this Isaiah passage, which says that God will come down and marry his people, to Jesus' first miracle at a wedding, turning water into wine, all the way to Jesus' final meal with his friends, a meal that he tells us to keep in remembrance, that is, to keep going. Don't let it stop. All of these things are so interwoven and interconnected. It's God's love letter to us. It's poetry from someone who is passionately in love with you. It's poetry from a God who is so enthralled with us, so in love with us, that he wants to be with us. But God loves us so much that he will never, ever force us to love him back. God loves us so much that he permits us to choose to love him, to choose to be faithful to him. God says so clearly, I love you. The question is, do we say back, I love you? Do we say it so much that it's insincere and has lost its meaning? Or do we never say it at all? 
Do our actions, actions towards God and actions towards one another, suggest that we don't love God? And have we ever said to God, I don't love you anymore? Have we ever said to God, I love someone else? This week, pay attention to how many times you say to someone, I love you. And pay attention to how many times someone says to you, I love you. And whether you hear it or whether you say it or not, sit for a moment this week and hear God's, not God's whisper, but hear God's powerful proclamation, I love you! I love you, God says. And then say it back to God out loud. I love you too. Amen. We proclaim, we proclaim the nature and the essence of the God whom we love and who loves us when we recite the deposit of faith found in the Nicene Creed. That can be found on page 358 in the Red Book of Common Prayer. With love we proclaim, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are Form 3, found on page 387. Form 3 on page 387. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will and in all that we undertake. 
that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Pray for those who feel unloved, those who feel abandoned, lonely, that they may know of God's love. We pray together for the election of a bishop found on the gold bookmark in your Book of Common Prayer. Almighty God, giver of every good gift, look graciously on your church, on all those who are discerning a potential call, and on the people of God in this diocese. And so guide the minds and hearts of those who shall choose the 11th bishop of the Diocese of South Dakota, that we may receive a faithful pastor who will care for our people and equip us for our ministries through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Turning back to page 360. For those times when we have not loved God as we should, for those times when we have not loved one another as we should, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Welcome, especially to any visitors and guests who may be with us this morning. Um, it's always a delight to welcome folks to Emmanuel and to have you here with us. Immediately following in our parish hall, there will be uh, some coffee and some treats. I hope you'll take some time uh, to visit with us, uh, bearing in mind, of course, that the kickoff is at 1 o'clock. And so any laggers, behinders will be locked into the church and we will see you Monday morning when we can let you out. Today was the second, was the, uh, today was the second installation of our adult forum on the world refugee crisis. Um, that next week, because next Sunday is the annual meeting, next Sunday's service is at 9 a.m., thank you. Um, we will not have an adult forum next week. It will resume in two weeks, and I do hope that you'll join us. That world refugee crisis presentation that Mark Rudebush and Ken and David Seeger are facilitating, it's, um, it's filled with lots of facts and interesting information. It is not a 
political agenda that's trying to be driven by the Episcopal Church. Rather, it is a desire to have hearts opened and informed. So regardless of how you feel or where you are politically on the issue, we can all come together with one unified Christian heart to hear facts, to have prayer, and to have have meaningful conversation with one another and pray for those who are in need. So please do not do not think that some political agenda is being driven and, and have that turn you off because we had some really engaging conversation this morning and not everyone agreed with one another and it was just fine. As I said, next Sunday is our annual meeting. We have the 9 o'clock service. For the last several years, um, well, first we have the service at 9, then we'll have the meeting in the parish hall immediately following the service with our Episcopal Church women offering a fellowship meal to follow the meeting. We have discovered that if we did the meal first that people don't stay for the meeting. I don't know what that's about. So we're going to make you sit through the meeting to get the food. And maybe we'll have some big stone jars filled with water. See what happens. The uh, part of our strategic plan has long been, and for the last three years, I believe now, um, we, have want, we want to get the annual report in your hands today, the week prior to the meeting, so that you're not walking in with this information and having to call through it uh, immediately. I will point out, however, uh, that being our goal, the reality is that our 2018 year-end financial statements are not in the book yet. That is because... Our bookkeeper, Tammy, has been focused on our audit and closing out 2017 and uh, doing all the things that come with, with an audit, which, as you might imagine, is pretty intense. So as soon as she gets the 2018 uh, financials done, we will email those out this week, I hope, and in the very least, we'll have an insert for you next week for the annual meeting. The same goes for a report from the Finance Committee and Vestry. They are, are working together in collaboration to, pr to produce um, an audit uh, review that sort of explains, especially for people like me who are not, not financially, uh, not financial wizards, but something that I can understand of what the audit found and discovered and what those recommendations are. Once that document is finalized and approved by everyone uh, involved, we will email that out and we will have a handout to insert into the, uh, into the annual report next week as well. Okay? Um, there's also a need for folks to sign up to serve as delegates for our annual diocesan convention in the fall, and they, those delegates will also serve uh, at, at the electing convention of our next bishop on May 4th. As I said last week, we have a heavy representation from the 8 o'clock crowd because they get to the clipboard first, and so I am asking for at least four or five others to sign up to become delegates for the convention so that next Sunday when we meet, we can have a, a, an authentic election for the process. If you have never been part of a bishop election in the Episcopal Church, this might be a fantastic opportunity to dig a little deeper into who we are and how, how we operate as a church. It's fascinating, it's, it's blessed, and it is filled with the Holy Spirit. So I do hope some of you from 1015 will offer yourselves for that service. We have out front our giving, your giving statements for the year um, to save postage. We put them out front so that you can pick them up. We will also have them at the annual meeting next week if you forget to pick them up today. And whatever is not picked up today or next week or during the week, uh, then we will mail those out on Monday of next week. Uh, I would also point out that today Mother Virginia Bird is sitting with us in the pew. Mother Virginia, since her ordination to the priesthood, has done a phenomenal amount of ministry uh, during the week, um, bringing the Eucharist out into the community, celebrating the Eucharist at various uh, nursing homes and facilities. And I noticed over the Christmas holiday, I was asking a lot of Mother Virginia, and I do love you, Virginia. I love you immensely, and I don't want you to burn out. And Mother Virginia does not receive a salary or a stipend. She does it uh, out of her call, out of her vocation. And so we agreed uh, a couple of weeks ago that each quarter, Mother Virginia will take two weeks off 
Maybe it'll be two weeks in a row. In this case, it's two separate weeks. But uh, during those weeks off, she, will, uh, she won't be coming to the church. She will not be responding to pastoral calls. She won't be up here serving um, at the service on Sunday. It's just to give her a break because she puts everything, every ounce of spiritual energy she has, she puts into loving you and sharing God's love with you. So, Mother Virginia, I know we'll acknowledge you next week, but thank you so much, and I do hope this week is a good respite for you. Yes, applaud. If there is a pastoral emergency, please call our office during office hours. If it's after office hours this week, please, please, please call my cell phone. Um, call, don't text. Um, I don't always get text messages, but call my cell phone and I will reply and respond promptly. Let's give Mother Virginia um, a little bit of time and space. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts. As we receive the gifts you offer out of love and generosity, we welcome, following the ushers, those who would like a blessing. Father, we ask that you be pleased with our offering and sacrifice, which you first offered unto us. Bless them and make them holy, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Sure. Heavenly Father, Love drives us into your arms, not only for ourselves, but for our friends who are in need. We ask, O oh Lord, that you hear the prayer of your beloved son, Richard, as he begs and pleads with you for help, mercy, compassion, and tenderness with your beloved son, Lou. We ask, O oh Lord, that you bless Richard by hearing his prayers and offering him the peace, the comfort, and the knowledge of the power of your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Oh, birthday, yes. Let's do the birthday prayer first. Watch over thy child, O Lord, as her days increase. Bless and guide her wherever she may be. Strengthen her when she stands. Comfort her when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise her up if she falls. And in her heart, may thy peace, which passeth understanding, abide all the days of her life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, continue to bless Mary Helen and Steve on their travels. We ask that you renew them in their love and that you allow them to arrive at their destinations in safety through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, wash away my iniquities. Cleanse me of my sins. Forgive me for when I have not loved you in return. We continue in our Red Book of Common Prayer on page 361. Please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people 
the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The invitation goes out to all baptized Christians, regardless of denomination. You are welcomed and encouraged to receive Holy Communion with us today. If you prefer a blessing, you may fold your arms. I'll be happy to offer a word of prayer. And we have gluten-free hosts available. If that's part of your need, please let me know when I get to you. Thank you. 
Friends, our post-communion prayer can be found on page 365. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May God, by the power that turned water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana, transform your lives and make glad your hearts. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Let us go forth in joy to love and serve the Lord and one another.